A lot of people think Venus flytraps are a tropical species, when in fact they're native only to a small region of North Carolina and a little bit of South Carolina. You'll see sort of their white dots of their flowers scattered over the landscape. I think people are often surprised to find that it flowers. It's lovely, but it doesn't strike you as anything, you know, amazing or unusual the way the rest of the plant is. I mean, this is the one plant that lives, you know, on dry land and has snap traps. So of course that, that's the thing that's going to get all of the attention. But there is very little research about how they actually live in their native environment. My name is Elsa Youngstead and I study urban ecosystems and plant-insect interactions. And I'm Laura Heyman and I study the pollination of Venus flytrap. An immense amount of research has been done on the traps. They have little trigger hairs and when an insect or spider or potential prey enters, the first time it touches a trigger hair, nothing appears to happen, but the plant goes on alert. And then the second time it touches a trigger hair within 20 or 30 seconds, that's when the trap slams shut. Most of what we know about it comes from laboratory and greenhouse situations, but these other aspects of its ecology are really important, especially now that there's concern about its conservation status. They grow within about a 70 mile radius of Wilmington, North Carolina, so it's threatened by a lot of development in the area. Venus flytrap depend on fire, so without fire, Venus flytrap gets overgrown by taller plants. So in areas that aren't managed, it might not be getting the regular fire that it needs. And finally, it's threatened by poaching. A lot of people still go out and collect these plants. And subsequently, it's a candidate for listing in, under the Endangered Species Act. So we started out a few years ago with two main questions, one of which was who pollinates Venus flytrap, because there was no information to date on that. The second thing we wanted to know was, do they ever eat their pollinators? There's this idea out there that carnivorous plants should, in general, avoid eating their pollinators to avoid you know, harming their own reproduction. And we all headed out in the field together to see you know, what flytraps are doing in the wild. It's just an enchanting, you know, beautiful environment. But the cool thing about this habitat is it's one of the most diverse habitats in the world. It's known for having a very high concentration of species in a small amount of space. You get a lot of different plants that you couldn't find anywhere else in the world. We spent a bunch of time wandering around patches of flowering flytraps, capturing whatever insects or spiders we could see on the flowers. Thankfully, catching pollinators is often pretty easy because when an insect's on a flower, it's focused on getting pollen or nectar, so you can bag it then. We also collected insects from the traps, so we pry the traps open with a pair of forceps and then just scoop out whoever's in there. And we took all of those insects back to the lab and swabbed the pollen off of their bodies to see if Venus flytrap pollen was there. Flytrap pollen is big and multi-lobed, very distinctive from other kinds of pollen. So we had a few sort of top candidates that included a little green sweat bee and a couple of species of beetles. But there was very little overlap between the species that we caught on flowers versus what we pulled out of traps. Usually it's crawling things, so the, the name flytrap is kind of a misnomer. They actually don't eat a lot of flies. So one of the next steps is this follow-up to see if more pollinators would actually result in more flytraps in the next generation. So I hand-pollinated certain flowers with extra pollen and checked to see if they produced extra seeds, and they did. Which means that you know, more pollinators would mean more seeds, which really reinforces the idea that these plants shouldn't be eating their pollinators. Like, they're already limited <laughs> by the number of visitors that they have to their flowers. But that still leaves open the question of, you know, what is the mechanism? There are sort of three main hypotheses or three main mechanisms. One is that distance between the flowers and the traps could be a strategy to avoid eating their pollinators. So we're going to test the hypothesis by manipulating model Venus flytraps so that the flowers are closer to the traps and seeing if you get a subsequent overlap in the pollinator and prey communities. But there's also the potential for some interesting differences in scent or the differences in the color. You know, maybe those cues are actively attracting different species. There are cases where a rare plant is so rare that it fails to attract pollinators. Or there are cases where a plant may become rare because the pollinator community is itself threatened. So plant conservation and insect conservation kind of go hand in hand. 
It's an important sort of charismatic species that I think a lot of people would get behind. But people forget that there are plants growing in their environment and there's still so much we need to know about how they actually live. Hey there, this is Luke Groskin, video producer for Science Friday. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, then you'll love our other science documentaries. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, then join our growing community of supporters on Patreon.